first and foremost, yung mga tao sa ground zero, around 27,000 internally displaced person, felt uh, miserable for more or less two years uh, after May 23, 2017. Napakaraming pamilya na until now hindi pa rin sila nagkakita-kita dahil sa uh, forced displacement. They are not only confined in, in the areas of Lanao del Sur but all other areas in, in, in the Philippines. Because for uh, past two years, the government discusses issue on uh, rehabilitation. These promises were broken. For the past few months, kaya walang nangyaring groundbreaking after the liberation because they are busy talking to Chinese uh, state firms, corporations na silang gumawa dito. Yun ang kumain sa malaking oras. One year after the so-called uh, liberation of Marawi City, ang Marawi ay matatawag natin na ghost town pa rin, lalo na yung main affected areas. Not a single masasabi natin na poste ay naitayo sa loob ng main affected areas for the past more than one year. So, yun ang concern natin kasi right after the liberation, the president himself promised publicly in a national television that itatayo niya ang mga bahay namin. But, and, but now, only few were accommodated by, by yung mga transitory shelters. It's not the promised peace deal of the century between Israelis and Palestinians. Still, U.S. President Donald Trump hailed the signing of the Abraham Accords at the White House as an historic day. After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. The agreement signed between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain formalizes relationships already in place but now includes the opening of embassies. It's a pivot point they hope will end old conflicts and lead to new cooperation among Israel and eventually even more Arab nations. To all of Israel's friends in the Middle East, those who are with us today and those who will join us tomorrow, I say, Assalamu Alaikum. Earlier in the day, Trump hinted that other countries will also be signing diplomatic pacts with Israel. Uh, but we'll have at least five or six countries coming along very quickly, and we're already talking to them. 
but noticeably absent from Tuesday's deal signing, Palestinian leadership. The foreign minister of the United Arab Emirates acknowledged their participation in the agreement required the preservation of current Palestinian land. Thank you for choosing peace and for halting the annexation of Palestinian territories, a decision that reinforces our shared will to achieve a better future for generations to come. In the Palestinian territories, there were protests over the deal that also failed to ease the 13-year blockade of people in Gaza. The human rights activists have likened to an open-air prison. This Trump official blames Palestinian leadership for refusing to negotiate. Separately, you have the leadership in Ramallah who time and time again refused to engage, refused to engage directly with Israel. Their method is to go to the United Nations, to the European Union. The road to peace is not through the United Nations. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free The divisions over this deal also on full display outside the White House. The Palestinian is the brothers, and they deserve to have a peace too. Without the Palestinian problem to be resolved, there is no peace will be in the Middle East. There are also questions in the United States about why the Abraham Accords are called a peace deal, given none of the nations are at war. There's also concern the so-called peace deal is really a new military alliance of nations with a common interest to confront Iran. The U.S. Congress already promising to scrutinize the deal, particularly over the possible sale of F-35 fighter jets to the UAE. But more importantly for President Trump, with less than two months until the U.S. election, the accords offer the optics of a foreign policy win for a president behind in the polls and eager for re-election. Kimberly Helk at Al Jazeera, the White House. Greetings of solidarity and welcome to Rise, Return, Resist, a webinar about the Palestinian and moral struggle for land, territory, and self-determination against imperialist and fascist attack. My name is Atama and I'm coming to you all the way from Malaysia. My organization is an indigenous people's organization from Tambunan, East Malaysia, known to the world, a location called North Borneo. And I'm a member of the ILPS Malaysia. This webinar is organized by ILPS Commission 10 with the help of the International Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation, Sami Dowun, Suara Bangsamoro, Sandugo, Resist US-led war movement, Refugees International, Liang Network, Kawa Gib, Ako Bakwit, and Philippines Palestine Friendship Association. We are now also broadcasting live on Facebook page of ILPS Commission 10, IPM SDL, and Sandugo. Ladies and gentlemen, and we are also live tweeting, so don't forget to use our hashtags, rise, return, resist, action for return, and free Palestine, Balik Marawi. To our speakers and everybody watching, we just want to uh, give you a few reminders that uh, our meeting is being recorded. To our audience and participants here inside Zoom, please keep your audio on mute. Please type in your name, country, and affiliation so we can address you much properly. We will be strictly monitoring our participants' interaction and remove them if necessary. 
For questions, inputs, and comments, please use the chat box in the Zoom room or comment directly in the ILPS Commission 10 Facebook comment section. We'll try to accommodate your inputs if we have time. So I think it's time where we're all set. So let's start right away. To warmly welcome all of us, let's now have Beverly Longid. She's the International Officer of Katribu, which is the Alliance of Indigenous Peoples and Organizations in the Philippines, which is ILPS Con Commission 10 convener as well. Beverly is also the Global Coordinator for IPM SDL. I invite Beverly Longit. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you, Atama. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning to our to our speakers, um, reactors, and participants to our webinar, Rice Return Resist. Um, this is the fourth webinar initiated by the International League of People Struggles, Commission 10. And we expect more webinars and online activities as the Commission 10 puts life in its declaration and resolution to strengthen the solidarity, solidarity of and for indigenous peoples, national minorities, and oppressed nations and nationalities against state oppression and imperialism and to actively campaign against the forcible eviction, dispossession, removal, and resettlement from our lands and territories, mm -hmm. resulting in internally displaced peoples, refugees, and evacuees that pushes us deeper into marginalization. On today's webinar, we'll discuss the congruent struggle of the Bangsamoro and Palestinian peoples embattled with wars and conflict and their struggle for self-determination and liberation and to development. Is it possible? How can peace and the right of return be achieved in a global context where imperialist powers like the U.S. dominate and aggravate wars of aggression with its ever-expanding military influence? Forcibly dispossessed from their homes and lands, Palestinians and the Bangsamoro people have no choice but to rise, resist, to return. The Palestinian people experiencing wide-ranging discrimination and rights violations continue to defend their homeland and fight for its right to return against annexation. In Mindanao, in the Philippines, the Bangsamoro, especially in the Islamic city of Marawi, remains displaced. Three years have passed since the siege of the city with no significant rehabilitation results, denying the residents their rightful return. With this also, aside from this, there's also an urgent need no, to bind the intersecting and complementary resistance against military-based occupation, unending war games and exercises, and other militaries and authoritarian measures that neither address the root causes of the global civic, political, and economic turmoil. Um, we hope as we deepen our understanding of uh, Palestine and Bangsamoro, so with our solidarity with the Bangsamoro and the Palestinian peoples, and answer for ourselves, what can we do? This webinar joins two important events this month, this September. First is the Palestinians' Action for Return starting September 18 to 26, with the theme, Palestinian Return and Refugee Rights Confronting Normalization Towards Liberation. And the second is the International League of People's Struggle um, declared Global Month of Solidarity for the Philippines. And we hope also that this effort will be one of our contributions in building the global anti-imperialist and anti-fascist united front. So we look forward to a very um, live and interesting um, discussions with two of our speakers and, of course, two uh, other reactors. And we look forward to your participation in continuing events of the ILPS Commission 10. So welcome and again, warmest greetings to all.
Uh, should I start, uh, Beverly? Atama, please unmute yourself. Apology, ladies and gentlemen. That was a while ago, Beverly. And now I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker. He's a Palestinian activist and writer whose work is widely published in Arabic and English. He coordinates a campaign entitled Free Ahmad Saadat. Ladies and gentlemen, I now welcome Khalid Barakat with his presentation. Khalid, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Atama and uh, Beverly. And it's an honor to be with you, uh, with all the comrades from ILPS and other organizations who are involved in this very important uh, webinar uh, and discussion. Um, it, Palestine, uh, and I will, I will use my time by immediately enter to the uh, topic. <coughs> Sorry. Palestine, uh, just a little bit of uh, history. I know, uh, uh, you know, uh, people want to talk about the current issues and challenges facing our struggle today in Palestine and uh, the Philippines and elsewhere. Uh, but just a, a little bit, little bit of, a, of a background history. Uh, and I think it's, it's important because uh, uh, it, it leads us to, you know, how did we get here? Palestine, in so many ways, like the Philippines, uh, it was uh, colonized and uh, a people who struggle against colonization for hundreds of years. And so uh, in 1917, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, a year that uh, changed the uh, entire uh, a situation in our uh, area in the Arab world and in the Middle East when the British colonization and the French colonization started after uh, inheriting the Ottoman Empire. 1917 is an important year also because uh, the in Palestine was becoming a uh, a place where the imperialist power and colonized co colonialist power started their project of uh, settling uh, European uh, Jews in Palestine in order to create uh, the state of Israel, in which we consider to be a settler colonialist project in Palestine. The British colonization in Palestine started in 1917 and it ended in 1947. So for 30 years, uh, there were a process and a project of uh, getting the stage ready to displace the vast majority of Palestinian people outside of their land and to bring settlers to Palestine in order to create uh, the state of Israel. And in 1948, Israel was declared as a, uh, as a state in, in Palestine. For us, Israel is an illegitimate uh, state in our land. It's an occupier and a colonizer, and they don't have any uh, right uh, to the land. Uh, and for Palestinians, uh, their struggle has been since 1917 up until uh, today, uh, guided by uh, the principles of liberation of our land. And after 1948, uh, the return of Palestinian uh, refugees. Uh, Palestine is a, only 27,000 square kilometers. Uh, more than 800,000 Palestinian refugees were displaced from their land in 1948. This is the vast majority of our people have become refugees uh, in surrounding Arab countries living in refugee camps. This is very important fact uh, to always remember because it refers to the core of the Palestinian people's struggle, and that is the right to return home uh, for Palestinian refugees. Now, of course, since 1917 until today, Palestinians have launched uh, 
one revolution after another and one popular uprising after uh, another. Uh, in 1967, Israel waged a war uh, and occupied the remaining uh, part of Palestine, which is uh, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and Jerusalem, which constitute 22% of the land of Palestine. So today, the entire land of Palestine is under occupation. Now, I want to uh, talk about the last 30 years of Palestinian struggle uh, quick, uh, and that is uh, the year of 1991. Uh, it was the first time where uh, Arab countries and Palestinians have sat publicly uh, in Madrid. They called it the Madrid Peace Conference. It was under the uh, invitation and auspices of the United States. Why this is an important conference? Because in that conference, the illusion of the peace process started. That's when they start selling the world the illusion of peace and the peace process. And under this uh, uh, slogan, the peace process, Israel continued its massacres against Palestinians. It continued colonizing the Palestinian land, building colonies, displacing Palestinians, doing all of the crimes that they do against our people. But this time they do it and they talk peace. They do it and they talk negotiations. And uh, uh, the peace process has been uh, a beneficiary for Israel and for the United States and for some of the Arab uh, regimes, particularly the Arab reactionary regimes. So uh, the Palestinian uh, and the Arab, uh, uh, the Palestinian leadership of, of, uh, of the PLO uh, have entered a secret negotiations in the capital of Norway. Uh, it is the famous negotiations of the Oslo agreement that was signed in 1993. And in that agreement, the Palestinian leadership basically uh, have taken uh, the path of illusion and uh, you know futile uh, process of the peace process. And today, we have seen that this process has led nowhere and everyone is uh, saying that we have reached a dead end and therefore uh, Israel uh, and the United States, particularly under the administration of Trump and Netanyahu is basically uh, saying that Palestinians uh, have uh, no rights. So from Palestinians have the right to the land, the right to self-determination, the right to return uh, under all United Nations, uh, you know, resolutions. Uh, now the U.S.-Israel line is that Palestinians have to accept what we offer them. And if they don't like it, uh, so what? Uh, what are, what are they going to do? They think that Palestinians are not in any position to fight back. They think that Palestinians are under siege. They think that Palestinians today are weak and they cannot, uh, you know, uh, confront this massive uh, colonialist and imperialist powers in the Middle East, particularly at a time where we see a new alliance is being formed by the triangle of death, uh, imperialism, Zionism, and the Arab reactionary regimes. These, this triangle, this uh, alliance uh, today is uh, being uh, declared publicly in the, uh, you know, signing of the full relationships between uh, United Arab Emirates and Israel uh, and Bahrain and Israel uh, under uh, the uh, supervision of the United States. Now, why this is happening? It is happening because the intensifying attacks of uh, uh, imperialism and fascism against people in the world, not just Palestinians, and we've seen how this is being played out uh, uh, worldwide, globally. Uh, and not just in the Middle East, not just in uh, in Palestine. Uh, we see how, for example, the fascist regime of Duterte is having a free hand 
in uh, committing all of these atrocities against the people of the Philippines, whether we're talking about, you know, uh, mass imprisonment, whether we're talking about assassination, whether we're talking about, you know, uh, being a tool for imperialist power and, uh, it can, you know, providing the stage of more economic intervention, more plunder of the, uh, you know, people resources, and neglecting a real peace approach uh, uh, in the Philippines is the same exact thing that it's happening in Palestine and elsewhere. We can give other examples of how indigenous uh, struggle and uh, uh, people under colonization are struggling, whether we're talking about you know, people in uh, Africa or in Asia or even in places like in Latin America. And this is also happening because the, the world is changing today. And the world is changing today in a way that is uh, uh, the United States want to make sure that it's still after, uh, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the socialist, uh, you know, bloc, uh, uh, prevent any of an international powers or pluralism powers on a global uh, level or even regional level. So we see that Palestine is uh, an absolutely in the hard core of not just a fight between Palestinians and Israelis, it is in the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict and it is the core of a regional conflict and an international conflict and which without understanding the relationship between how these uh, circles interact with each other and affect each other, uh, we will not be able to see also uh, how people can resist such uh, powers. So the most uh, visible ones that you hear often in the media, for example, is, uh, you know, the Gaza Strip. Uh, Gaza, as uh, you know, uh, is being under siege for the past 13 years. Total blockade on Gaza uh, from the uh, air, from land, from sea. Israel is besieging a very tiny strip in Palestine that is 360 kilometers where 2 million people live. It's an, basically an open air prison. Uh, the highest densely populated area worldwide, and they are besieging uh, Gaza with the most sophisticated weaponry uh, system that is provided to Israel by the United States, by Germany, by uh, uh, France, uh, uh, you know, uh, UK, and others. And so, why is the siege? This siege is to bring the Palestinian resistance to uh, surrender. This is to uh, a collective punishment of two million Palestinians who are basically the uh, incubator of this resistance. So people pay a very heavy price because they support their resistance, particularly their uh, popular resistance and their uh, military uh, resistance. And under very hard conditions, social conditions, economic conditions, Palestinians in Gaza are fighting back. The Palestinian resistance is actually growing in terms of its military strength and its experience and its accumulating of knowledge and how to uh, fight in such, uh, you know, harsh conditions. Because in Gaza, for example, we don't have mountains and we don't have space and we don't have uh, vast land, we don't have islands, we don't have it's very small uh, piece of land. And so the, the, the tactics that Palestinian resistance use in terms of fighting occupation is building literally uh, underground uh, tunnels and uh, uh, networks uh, in order to uh, sustain the resistance and develop its uh, weaponry uh, strength. And today the Palestinian resistance manufacture all of its uh, weapons. Uh, so even if there is a total siege uh, on Gaza, uh, the Palestinian resistance managed to 
actually uh, uh, manufacture all the uh, the uh, weapons that they need in the West Bank, uh, and that's where where Israel is focusing today in terms of uh, the annexation project. Now. Uh, as I said, the entire land of Palestine is under occupation. So how could we call this an annexation of piece of land if the, the entire land is, uh, is under occupation? Well, they just want to, uh, you know, it's, it's a continuation of a law that the Zionist movement have carried on against Palestinian people for uh, over... Uh, uh, 72 years now and that is more land and less arabs uh, to grab more resources uh, plunder more uh, of the palestinian resources and drive palestinians outside of uh, of palestine and the way they do that uh, today they cannot do it this, the same way they did it in 1948 and 1967 by displacing hundreds of thousands at one time so what they do they do it gradually so when you hear israel is building a new colony in the west bank that means more palestinians will be displaced gradually when you hear house demolitions for example carried on a daily basis whether in the West Bank or Jerusalem or even inside Israel, inside the land that was occupied in 1948, you can see you can see that these hundreds of Palestinian houses demolished on a yearly basis will mean more Palestinians uh, living under harsh conditions and therefore leaving uh, uh, the land or being forced to what we call the slow transfer uh, policy. Uh, Inside Israel, where two uh, million Palestinian lives, uh, they do have Israeli citizenships, but there are uh, laws of discrimination, a systematic discrimination against them, because the entire structure of the state of Israel is built in colonialist, uh, racist uh, process. So whether you're Palestinians who lives inside Israel, or whether Palestinians you live in Gaza, or whether you are a Palestinian, you live in the West Bank, you don't have the same rights as an Israeli or as a Jewish person, particularly in uh, Gaza and the West Bank, because uh, Israel not just besiege uh, Gaza and the West Bank with walls and checkpoints and military checkpoints and surveillance of uh, every uh, method and way, but also uh, the, uh, there is a, a direct military uh, occupation. Now, uh, the, the Zionist discourse to the world uh, is like, uh, well, we, we have left Palestinian uh, cities, we left Palestinian, uh, the Gaza Strip, but Palestinians still fire rockets at us and they still uh you know uh not uh, accepting that we even uh, we even left so so the problem is the palestinians you should blame the palestinians don't blame us because what we uh what we did is we left uh, gaza and that's of course uh, a myth uh, and a lie because uh, the israelis yes they were forced to leave uh, Gaza in 2005 because due to the Palestinian resistance, uh, but also because they wanted to place Gaza under siege. And uh, it, when we talk about siege in Gaza, we are talking about people absolutely cannot move outside of Gaza. They cannot, for example, travel when they want to. They cannot, students cannot, go and continue their education in a proper way. If you're sick, you cannot go and seek uh, health, uh, you know, care outside of Gaza due to lack of, uh, you know, uh, medical and uh, 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 health care proper in, in Gaza. So basically, they control the lives of Palestinians uh, in Gaza that they cannot leave the Strip. But you can move inside Gaza, inside this prison, uh, as much as you like, but you can't leave Gaza. In the West Bank, 
Sometimes to go from one city to another, you have to go through checkpoints. Sometimes to go Mr. to visit Khalid, your... be bearing yes. in mind our time, we invite you to do a wrap up. Thank you, yes. Khalid. With yes. a wrap up. I will wrap up by saying that this is what Palestinians go through in Palestine. However, the vast majority of our people are outside Palestine. So that's why Palestinians struggle. Anchor is the right of return for Palestinian refugees to their homes from outside and the full liberation of Palestine inside the Palestine. And so I'll stop here. I'm sorry if I took more uh, time than I, uh, I have should, uh, uh, you know, uh, more than uh, I supposed to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much with a very in-depth presentation from Khaled Barak. Most of us in the world, especially here in Asia, may not know the details of the situation in Palestine. Thank you once again, Khaled. And now let's uh, remind you that we have a hashtag. And, um, and uh, here is the hashtag. I'll read it to you. It is called uh, Rise, Return, Resist. Action for return, free Palestine, and Balik Marawi. Ladies and gentlemen, we are also broadcasting to you live on Facebook. We've heard from our first speaker. Now let's bring in our second speaker. Samira Gutok is uh, from Akko Bakwit. Bakwit. She is the chair which is an organization promoting and protecting the rights and welfare of internally displaced persons and contributing to government efforts of community and nation building. She's a journalist, women's and peace advocate. She's a civil society leader, a former legislator in the ARMM. She's a spokesperson of Ranau Rescue Team, which is assisting the government and survivor families of missing and dead persons from the siege. She was awarded by the United Nations Development Program N-Peace Award as a community organizer in Marawi City. Now let's go to the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Samira. Good talk. Samira, the floor is yours for your presentation. Yes, salamu alaikum, brother Atam. Thank you very much to the IPMSDL uh, through our uh, Abel Suara Philippine host. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity, Bev, and all freedom comrades all over the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our uh, uh, viewers. And um, I am Samira Gutok from Philippines, southern part of the Philippines from the Islamic city of Marawi. And I have a few slides uh, that uh, I'd like to share with you because um, of the very uh, you know, pressing concern about displacement and the impact also on our children. Next, please. So uh, the Philippines is an archipelago of 7,100 islands. And next, please. We, are, um, we have been... Um, uh, influenced or uh, visited by missionaries from Malay, the Malay world in the, in the 13th century, we are uh, seen to have Islamic presence already. And uh, by 1521, the Spaniards came, jump-starting 300 years of uh, colonization with the Spanish. And Americans, in 1898, the Spanish uh, annexed us and uh, sold us to the Philippine or to the US government. Uh, by virtue of Treaty of Paris, 1898. And one of the uh, ru rules or one of the uh, standing laws that have influenced us from the Americans is that uh, the public land laws uh, that are inspired by the Regalian Doctrine provides that you're supposed to have titles or lands. And much of our ancestral domain in the Philippines, not just in the Bangsamoro, not just in the Southern Philippines, not just in the Muslim minorities and in the indigenous non-Muslim communities, these are non-landed, non-titled, non-recorded by uh, virtue of the trust 
that the Philippine natives, our Muslim natives, our indigenous natives have put in to their traditions and cultures and way of life. And uh, their view that uh, uh, they are not covered no, by uh, their um, this uh, doctrines that have been put there in place no, by colonial governments because they have not been influenced and governed by the colonial governments. So uh, this is one policy that shows how different uh, these are ingrained no, in policy in the past, 19, in the 19th century. And you've seen how throughout time, next slides, will show that uh, in Mindanao, you've had the loss of lands. There was an encouragement from the northern part of our country for the resettlement of our country, um, uh, co-Filipinos from the northern part of our country to the southern part. Please uh, show the slides on how the minorities gradually out of time have uh, reduced their numbers. No? And this is the colonial, colonial impetus from the Americas. So can you imagine from the, the green is the Muslim majority population. So from a majority of 1918 population and the indigenous peoples is the violet, you've seen how they've moved. Uh, the yellow is the, uh, the Christian, uh, converted populations, especially from the north, the northern part of the Philippines. So throughout time, there has been a, uh, how do you call it, a minoritization. So this literature on minoritization is something that um, is still really not part of our Philippine history books. That's why it's interesting that this coming back to school, there is an encouragement also of studying uh, Bangsamoro history. And that is our push and advocacy. Uh, and also there is a, a push to learn martial law in our Philippine history books, in our Philippine educational system uh, to our children and to our high school students to see that these histories are even many of the photographs of our ancient uh, Filipinos, the Datus and the re religious or the Muslim Datus, indigenous Datus are in the US library. So we might need the help of the IPMS at DL USA to find our photographs of our ancestors there in the US Congress in Washington. Next, please. So in this last, in this last slides, we see that there is really like the uh, stories of pain and resilient um, stories of massacres in the past because of the resistance movements. Um, the, uh, the spark of the martial law, it was not just in Manila where the resistance came from the writers, the church, and the activists, and uh, Senator Aquino, but even in the Moro South, where people resisted uh, martial law, 1970s. So uh, you know already the US influence also on uh, then President Marcos, where he had, I think, uh, consulted uh, the then US president on his actions on martial law in, this, in the country. And these are some of the stories, uh, very, very graphic at that. Um, that are now just being recently documented. You know that, again, in the cultural groups, the Moro communities, the indigenous communities, they are not fond of, they are not writing, they are not documenting. They, again, live in a culture of, um, hopefully not isolation, but uh, really that they don't expose and talk about it in public writing in books. Uh, in the Spanish newsletters, in the new U.S. newsletters, you have zero, almost zero nil contribution of moral literature, knowing that the word moral came from the uh, enemies of the crusades, the Muslim Moors, <laughs> the Muslim Moors. And that in the Philippines is the moral, <laughs> the moral enemy, the moral, the dead moral is a good moral. The creation of a US 45 gun bullet was really to target a moral. That is one saying here by uh, some US um, soldier <laughs> quoted in uh, some history books. So please, next please. So very graphic stories that are currently just being documented through the justice board or uh, there is a, a creation of a human rights claims board which is supposed to have documented the Sulu burning of the 1970s. So it was not just a Marawi spark but also the Sulu, much more the Sulu. That's why the Moro National Liberation Front it's major. The Moro Front was majorly founded in the MNLF in Sulu because of 
the hollow burning where uh, literally uh, there was uh, the houses raised and this fighting uh, that occurred and really displaced uh, the peoples. So the Southern Philippines martial law was really seen in the burning. And uh, this was jump sparked, of course, by what incident? The Jabida massacre. The Jabida massacre must be of interest to the international, to the Americans, because the Jabida massacre is um, the expose that the senator, then uh, Senator Ninoy Aquino, who went on exile in the U.S., this is was was one of his uh, major exposés that showed the dictatorship's uh, abuse uh, in the Philippines. That Jabida massacre, which recruited um, Moro Muslim recruits to do. Uh, and the uh, islands to fight off Sabah, fight in Sabah so that they can take Sabah by virtue of Marcus's dream of uh, taking Sabah Malay, uh, Malay part of Sabah. So as you see, we've had a very expensive war and uh, not just uh, during the wars of 300 years between the Moro and the uh, Spanish and the U.S. and <laughs> with the co-Filipinos, 288 billion pesos. And I, I shudder how much of that is from the US in case there is a US support for this um, physical war in the South and in the Philippines. And we, we know, uh, we, we remind, the word, the, the numbers are 120,000 lives. And we don't have markers or names of these people, of those who died. We don't have libraries that contain the names of 120,000 lives. They're just a kind of a summary that's contained in documents, in, uh, in books, in uh, the storytelling, again, in narratives by those who talk about martial law's impact in the Southern Philippines, much more in the Muslim South. Next, please. So, uh, yeah, 2017, century later, <laughs> century later, um, 2017, almost a century later, is 2017 Marawi siege. There was a standing FBI search because there is an FBI list that Hapilon of Basilan is one of the most wanted terrorists. He was up for indictment in the U.S. and he is in Marawi at that time, Mar March 2017, May 2017, and uh, there was a uh, bounty on his head, Happy Lon. Uh, bounty on his head. And this was, of course, <laughs> something that could be happily taken a mission by the Philippine local forces. And 2017, May 23, in a lunchtime, in a very busy community of, of graduation time, uh, at about afternoon, the encounter between the forces and Happy Lon who was attending this major spiritual assembly of men, this regular assembly here in Marawi, uh, occurred in that highway, was the exchange of fire and led to the legendary now Marawi siege because that encounter contributed to the taking over of the highway, taking over the Philippine police station in the Marawi, taking over or having a fight at the hospital and fires here and there and there for the fighting escalated few two days later three days later martial law was declared without consultation to the local no engagement of the mlf milf ceasefire committees there was no engaging the local government president signed martial law order ordered the department of defense from while he was in russia while he was in russia he made that decision out of anger, out of a spite that this young man can actually do, uh, you know, retaliate the forces of the government. We don't know. There's no investigation there in the House, in Congress. Next, please. Five billion is just one of the statistics in one article of how much was used land, sea, and air, artillery, all kinds of forces in Marawi were used in a very small area of uh, Marawi, a very rural setting, despite it's a city, but it's really very local vibe, very, no malls, no libraries. <laughs> there is no commercial, 
malls. The highest building is three floors, four floors, <laughs> five floors. So can you imagine the whole of the armed forces, special forces, maybe even Americans who were there in the Philippine military camp were assisting, yes. Some Russian technology was even used. How much could have been used for our educational system in the region that is poorest in the country? The oldest community in the country is the poorest centuries later. A tragedy. A tragedy. Half a million people have been displaced. Some of them have returned since then. After five months, six months of the war, some of them have returned, but not have not all have returned. And they're all over the country. They're all over the Philippines. They're all over the world. As, well, finding work, finding uh, income. And the government has only built 2,000, 1,000 houses, shelters for these numbers. So for a country with 40 years of on and off conflict with the Moro resistance movement, you don't have internally displaced bill, person's bill. So therefore, if you're displaced and moved to the Manila, you're not part of the local register of Manila. You are not given any relief. You are not given any assistance. Your identification does not give you privileges as a normal citizen of Manila because you don't have the normal certification, the civil registrar, a population that does not have a monitoring, tracking, a documentation culture. It does not document itself. Again, it doesn't write itself. It doesn't not claim for itself. <laughs> it, it actually just you <laughs> allow, uh, I know, gets the Philippine government through the Bangsamoro yeah. leadership who are also busy themselves right now set it, setting up a government. So memories, memories, memories. We can only have memories of one of the longest conflicts of the yeah. world, 40 years of peace agreement, and first year of Bangsamoro government in transition. A uh, people of hunger, a people of displacement, but a people of uh, high pride because of their fight with the Spanish and Americas in the past. They continue to live and survive, whether in trade, whether in government as civil servants, they're trying to fight discrimination at all levels. So next, please. This is the neighboring because we don't have many written reports about the Marawi histories. So with this um, graphic at that, um, there's so many videos of Marawi. That's why I didn't tell any more of Marawi incidents because you've seen anyway a lot of the videos in you uh, you know foreign uh talk of the marawi this is really the example by which how one uh how we have not learned from history and that the story of displacement and landlessness uh the property uh the land ancestral domains of marawi are still uncertain if they're uh, really returning back to their homeland um i put in the chat box that proclamation order that says much of Marawi city is really owned by the military. <laughs> and I wonder which legislator, Congress, Matt person will take this to task in really making us return finally home to an uncertain home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much to our uh, presenter, Samira, coming from uh, Malaysia and learning about briefly about the struggles of uh, the Moro people um, of the Southern Philippines. It really gives us encouragement to understand more. And uh, for your information, ladies and gentlemen and friends in the Philippines, at this very moment, my home state of Sabah, we are in uh, election during the time of a uh, COVID-19. And uh, knowing about this gives us more uh, in-depth uh, in understanding about the struggles of uh, the peoples of Southern Philippines and especially uh, the peoples affected by the wars over there, especially 
country. Thank you very much. I want to uh, encourage all of us uh, to send in uh, your questions uh, into the, uh, the Zoom uh, chat box that we have, uh, because this will help us um, to discuss further um, uh, later uh, in our time that, that we are here with you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let us now present to you a, a cultural presentation. There is a song entitled Di Yan Di. It is performed by Edge from the Tubao Music Collective. Over to you now. Ang susunod na kanta ay may pamagat na Di Yan Di. Para sa mga bagobot blaan, ito po ay nangangahulugan ng peace pact o kapayapaan Para po sa ating lahat, ito po ay pakikisangkot at pakikibahagi sa pakikibaka ng katutubong mamamayan para sa kanilang karapatan sa lupang ninuno at sa sariling pagpapasya. At para sa ating lahat, ito rin ay paglaban uh, sa lahat ng uh, anyo ng uh, korupsyon at pandarambong, pagyurak sa ating mga demokratikong karapatan, panunupil, uh, at ito rin ay para biguin ang terorismo ng Estado. Sana po'y maibigan ninyo ang uh, version na ito uh, ng awiting uh, Deandi para po sa inyong lahat. Itigil ang kanasan the guitar. He's from uh, the Tubao 
music collective with a song entitled D and D. It's amazing when we have a webinar of such, the songs of struggles are echoed in the melodies of resistance. Let's now enter into our uh, second part of our event um, with feedbacks and reactions from our guest reactor. Ladies and gentlemen, our first reactor is Sahar Atrache. She is a senior advocate for the Middle East and Refugee International, previously the senior advocacy officer at the Syrian American Medical Society, or SAMS, where she led research and advocacy efforts around Syria policy and humanitarian issues in the United States and Middle East. Previously, a senior analyst on the Middle East and North Africa at International Crisis Group, she had served with the United Nations in Lebanon. Our first reactor, Sahar Atrache, you have the floor now. Um, thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, to be honest, I come from, from a very different background. So I'm mostly a researcher um, and an analyst, uh, less an activist, although I like to think of myself as, as an activist too. Um, the type of work I do, and now I currently work for Refugees International, uh, me and my colleague, we're like constantly uh, meeting and researching crisis uh, and mostly displacement caused either by conflict, by climate change, by other, you know, uh, natural disaster. Um, and it's so unfortunate, you know, to, for me to see that, uh, uh, of course, we're today talking about the issue of Palestinians uh, and of uh, Marawi, but uh, we, uh, we see, you know, th these tragedies all over the world. Uh, um, I want to talk very quickly about the region I cover, and it happened that I just uh, published a report on Gaza. So Khalid uh, um, gave a background about the history, you know, of, of Palestine and now the situation. So I'm going to try to comment uh, a little bit on the situation there, but uh, broaden a bit the discussion, you know, to um, talk about, you know, displacement in general and, and phenomenon that we uh, see around the world and mostly in the region I cover, which is uh, the Middle East. So, um, I mean, Khalid, you know, he, he spoke very clearly about the how Gaza is under siege right now. It's been, the blockade has been going for 13 years, of course, with a varying degree of uh, restriction or reopening. And a lot of times, you know, some really critical basic commodities like fuel were used as a uh, collective punishment basically against the population. We've seen this recently in August where there was an escalation again inside the Strip. Um, we're now, you know, in Gaza facing a situation where um, in light of COVID-19, uh, an already very uh, dire uh, economic and humanitarian crisis is just exacerbated. Um, um, and Khalid again, like mentioned uh, a bit, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the situation, the, um, basically the lack of prospect, I, I feel is the most important and the lack of hope for the future that we've seen, you know, when we talk to people inside Gaza, the, the feeling of being um, um, under a blockade where movement is very much restricted, both by Israel, by Israel and maybe at varying degree also by, by Egypt, um, there's um, a, a very high uh, level of unemployment. Um, so what we're seeing is really like there's a lack of prospect for the future. And for me, I, I see this phenomenon almost everywhere we work because of these very difficult conditions that people, you know, uh, mostly displace or besieged are, are uh, living under. Um, right now, there's lots of worries because there has been a spike of, you know, an increase in the number of COVID-19s inside this trip. 
um, knowing that uh, the health system has been basically obliterated throughout the years of violence and blockade and uh, you know lack of funding. Um, so it, definitely, I think you know, like uh, uh, Khalid was able to to convey a bit this this you know like uh, um, very difficult situation uh, inside Gaza. He mentioned uh, also annexation, um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing now. I mean, I work for an organization that called for peace, and um, from the perspective of so many, you know, officials, especially years in the U.S., they see the normalization agreement between uh, the UAE and Israel from one side, and, and Bahrain and Israel as a as a as a step towards a peace. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think this is the reality. Um, in my view, personally. Uh, the, the 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 deal the, this these agreements are just uh, gonna exacerbate the real conflict which is the uh, israeli palestinian conflict and uh, what we've seen is that mostly palestinians were excluded the um a, a, and we're switching from you know like we might have our criticism about the oslo accord but at least there was a path for for a peace process um now we're switching from talking about, uh, you know, the end to occupation um, with this normalization as just the end to annexation. And and even though, you know, the, the right now there has been um, a freeze to annexation, this doesn't mean that the plan is not still on the table and might occur. What we've seen in the West Bank is um, de facto annexations uh, happening, you know, and settlements growing. Um, I think we're talking about five to six hundred thousand settlers in, in in the West Bank. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are just few comments that I wanted to make. I uh, have to admit that I'm not very familiar with the situation in Marawi, so I'm not gonna comment on this. But I just want to give like a few. Um, um, maybe general ideas or general background of what we see uh, in general, as I said, in the region. So um, in the past decade or so uh, in the Middle East, um, we've seen, you know, the, the what started as the so-called Arab Spring, so Arab uprising, uh, shifting towards more conflict and leading to uh, increased displacement, mostly among Syrians, but also among other other uh, uh, communities and and countries, uh, all over the world. I think right now we're talking about uh, more than seventy million pe displaced people. So we're talking about displaced, whether internally or as refugees. Um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing in the you know international sphere that the space for refugees is is uh, becoming more restricted. Uh, Countries are raising, you know, like walls between on the border. They're uh, trying to prevent uh, um, um, even access to safety for a lot of, of refugees and IDPs. And what we see too, for example, if I can give the example of Syria, is that um, we're talking about uh, almost six million people internally displaced, but but the conflict has be become protracted and. Uh, even for those who are internally displayed, the return uh, to their hometowns uh, has become increasingly uh, a challenge. Um, um, the situation in, in Yemen is as uh, dire. It's, it's considered one of the uh, worst humanitarian crises uh, currently. And... Um, for me, it's it's um, uh, it's a combination of 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 a lot of reasons. But but one thing, maybe um, just to go back to the Palestinian issue that Khalid didn't really mention, is also internal divisions among you know the Palestinian Authority, Fatah and Hamas, and we see this like uh, throughout the region. Um, Basically, uh, you know, polarizing communities, polarizing populations, 
um, that um, here you're talking about, you know, like imperi imperialist powers and external powers. But what we see usually is that there are rifts within societies that usually uh, leave a gap and, and that external power try to uh, exploit. And this is a phenomenon that we've seen in Palestine, we've seen in Syria, in Yemen, uh, in Lebanon, in almost most countries. So I, I just want you know to broaden and maybe also push us to reflect on our own um, gaps in a way. Um, so uh, usually conflicts and, and displacement is just a combination of so many factors. Um, I'm gonna stop here uh, because I know I, I'm just uh, was asked to comment a bit on, on the uh, speakers, uh, but I'm happy to answer other questions. Thank you very much, very, very much, Sahar, uh, for uh, providing us with um, your response and uh, you being a wonderful reactor, our very first re reactor. Um, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> our, um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Our, our second reactor, ladies and gentlemen, is the organizer with the Resist US-led War Movement. He's the member of the International Coordinating Committee of the ILPS, where he serves as auditor. Uh, Secretariat member on ILPS4, which is a commission for peace for the people, and uh, Commission 13 where uh, it's a science and technology for people's development. He joins us from Portland in the United States. Please welcome our second reactor, Cody Urban. Cody Urban, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, so much, Atama, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Khaled, Samira, and Sahar for all of your remarks. Um, it really is a, a big task to follow all of you. Um, but I'll really do my best. Um, so the Resist US-led war movement, which I'm very, very honored to represent today, um, is a um, global anti-war movement that focuses against US-led war and really names US-led war as the number one purveyor of human rights violations in the world today and really is the driving force behind all wars happening um resist is a global network that is really based around um two major calls to action one being to resist us-led war and the other being to build just peace and i think that with these two sort of pillars um that build up this the build up our movement um it really sets our movement apart from other anti-war movements because of the way that we really call out what US-led war is, but also really work to define what peace actually is. Because I think what we've heard today is that, you know, there are many powers in the world that be today that would say that, you know, they would call for us to fight for a certain kind of peace that would just maintain their own profits and their own monopoly over violence. Um, so in the Resist US-led war movement, we really are trying to organize the people broadly and extensively to challenge this definition of peace and work towards a definition that builds a just and lasting peace. So on that note, to really build, to respond to the, our speakers today, I wanna start by really sussing out what US-led war actually is and what war is in general. So I'll actually go to a quote from Lenin, where Lenin said that war is the continuation of politics by other means. It is the continuation of the politics of the powers concerned and the various classes within these countries in a definite period. And so what this means is that we can't separate war from broader political policy. And we can't separate any political policy from the class interests behind it. 
And so what this comes down to means that war is a crucial and decisive element in the development of class struggle, and particularly regarding national oppression and national liberation. And so on this question, um, I think that both Khalid and Samira gave us a wide range of examples of what it means to resist US-led war by fighting for land and self-determination. Um, a common theme that we heard between, um, from the struggles in both Palestine and Marawi um, is the issue of how land is at the center um, of both of their national struggles. Um, both Khaled and Samira spoke about um, just how far back the history of the land and its people goes and how the various colonial powers have tried to reshape that history for their own economic and political interests. And so any movement to reclaim the history of a land's people for the future really has to be led by the movement to reclaim the land itself. And so because of this central struggle for land, um, it really is shown that any mass movement against US-led war has to be international in scope. It must take the leadership from movements fighting for land and self-determination. This is because war is the only way for imperialism to, to maintain its territorial domination of the world. And it does so by securing land for the ruling classes, be they landlords or bureaucrat capitalists. This makes the movements struggling for land and territory the front lines of the struggle against US-led war. And the Resist US-led War Movement acknowledges this wholeheartedly in our, um, as we're building up this ma major mass movement uh, to combat US-led war, both from within the US uh, where I live, um, but also around the world at every single front that the US tries to rear its ugly head, which is just about every corner of the world. Um, another theme that came to my mind for me listening to both, listening to both Helen and Samira is how land grabs are almost always these days combined with the militarist rhetoric with the war on terror, in particular, the war against Muslims around the world and how that inflames uh, xenophobic um, ideologies and particularly within, not just within the imperialist nations, but within semi-colonial and semi-feudal nations as well, and relying on these ideologies of hatred to continue the pursuits of imperialist war. So whether it's a war on communism, a war on drugs, or a war on terror, there always has to be one buzzword or another inserted to hide what every imperialist war actually is, which ultimately is just a war on the working masses of the world, a war on all of us. Now we heard about this in Palestine, we heard about it in Marawi, and it's similar in many other places around the world. For example, in Kashmir right now, um, where we actually have a situation where the government of India has been consulting with the Zionist occupation regime in order to build their own apartheid regime in Kashmir. Um, akin to how the, the Israeli occupation of Palestine has very deliberately programmed their period, their settler colonial project of ethnic cleansing. Um, where in Kashmir as well, the domicile law that um, India is using to enact land grabs um, for Indian settlers and corporations can only take place after Kashmiris are violently expelled from their land. Um, which is a very similar um, phenomenon from what we heard from both Samira and Khaled um, in their presentations. So this is very much a central piece, of, again, of US-led war around the world. And so going back to the question of land and national self-determination, one thing that our movement must recognize is that semi-colonial and semi-feudal countries have their economies kept intentionally backwards by the imperialist global economy. And this means that they cannot achieve national industrialization. So while this makes it easier for local, reaction, real, uh, local reactionary regimes to exploit their working people and displace them from their land, it also means these regimes must rely on imperialist powers for the industries that they need. 
and that critically does include weapons. Um, this is actually how semi-colonial and semi-feudal nations become inexorably locked into the global arms trade, which only really benefits the weapons monopolies of the world, um, which there's only a small handful, um, the top ones being Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, all of these based in the US, but of course there's others based in um, other countries as well, such as Elbit, located um, within uh, the 48th territory of Palestine under the Israeli occupation. Um, and so therefore weapons deals are a crucial way for um, US imperialism to maintain its power. Most of these today are going to West and East Asian regimes. Um, many weapons deals recently have gone to the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam. Recently, there was a $20 billion arms sale awarded to Japan, which is US imperialism's strongest military satellite in the Asia Pacific, as well as to, uh, in West Asia to Saudi Arabia, to the United Arab Emirates, to Israel. And this, and this is in a way that we're seeing the so-called US pivot to East Asia um, commence, uh, which started under the Obama regime. It's escalated under the Trump regime. Um, where it's come, where this big removal of U.S., this pivot of U.S. military troops to the Asia Pacific has come with further consolidation of reactionary regimes um, in West Asia, such as Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, um, as well as the, um, the Israeli regime. Um, and this, of course, is happening in, it's like in countries such as UAE, where 90% of its population is migrant labor. 90% of the population of the United Arab Emirates are migrants, many of them Filipino migrants. And the exploited labor of these migrant workers is creating the wealth that is used um, to enact war around the region on Palestine and Yemen. Um, so this is another way that um, both Khaled and Samira's um, uh, presentations are inexorably linked as well. And so uh, to try to finish up, um, I appeal to all my brothers, sisters, comrades around the world who consider themselves as part of the broader anti-war movement to work to embody the fighting spirit that Khaled and Samira brought to this panel today. It's the fighting spirit that has led the fight against US imperialism since it first uh, reared its ugly head. And to finish up, um, Monday, the UN marked International Peace Day, where it, it used very abstract language about, quote unquote, um, celebrating the day by spreading compassion, kindness, and hope, and observing 24 hours of nonviolence and ceasefire, saying that, quote, it is clearer than ever that we are not each other's enemies. Well, I'll say to that, that while compassion, kindness, and hope are indeed ideals to strive for, they remain only ideals without an analysis behind their absence and a program of action for achieving them. And while the people themselves are not each other's enemies, there is an enemy of the people, and that is US imperialism. So let's mark International Peace Day by reaffirming our will to fight for our freedom. Global UN ceasefires will not change the monopoly of violence that US imperialism has to maintain its dying existence. Only militancy can combat militarism and only a mass movement can take down an empire. Only the people united in struggle can usher in a just and lasting peace for all. Thank you, long live international solidarity. Indeed, Cody Urban, long live international solidarity. Ladies and gentlemen, you are still with us on our webinar today, a very important webinar, in fact. Uh, we've come to the third part of our event. Now let's move to question and answer. And for the past 30 minutes, we've been we have been receiving so many uh, questions. And now it's a time to call our speakers and reactors to give their answers. But uh, let me uh, quickly um, get first, uh, the uh, the questions uh, from from my list. Um, <clears throat> please give me a minute. I'm shifting from one 
uh, page uh, to another page because I'm using a, a mobile device. I'm uh, uh, I'm I'm in a remote uh, uh, part. Uh, um, just allow me a few seconds to uh, navigate around this. <clears throat> okay, um, the first question um, is for our speakers and reactors. And here we go. Uh, the question goes like this: How can I pressure New Yorkers, especially out? democratic lawmakers into questioning their pro-Israeli views. For the anti-Moro and pro-war in Mindanao, what can I do to change their views? So this is definitely coming in from our audience in New York. And uh, again, let me uh, uh, repeat that. Um, what can um, we do to pressure New Yorkers, especially out democratic lawmakers into questioning their pro-Israeli views and for the anti-Moro and pro-war in Mindanao, what can I do uh, to change their views? Um, I open this question to our uh, speakers and uh, reactors. Yeah. Who would Thank like you. To go first? Take it away. Thank you, Atama. Of course, uh much of the articulation is needed. We really are ill-equipped with articulation po. Uh, we are besieged with our displacement of several years, poverty of decades, <laughs> the importance of the country, and uh, our immobility and our fear in the anti-war terror, anti -terror war uh, is uh, a multiple burden that we have to deal with. And uh, also our clannish cultures that make us prioritize our local needs rather than any political aspiration or any political injustice or politically charged uh, organizing, mobilizing. The elites are busy. <laughs> the elites and the dynasties affirm power. The poor and weak are weakened. There's not much of us in the mass communication sector uh, civil society cannot transcend and uh, shift to political empowerment, political party organizing. There's not much logistics and support. Women are incapacitated to join political uh, with the gender dynamics in place, not just in the national, but also in the local. As, as more, more so the culture, in, in its culture, which discourages uh, voicing out loudly as women. So we really need your help in, in the, how do you call, political articulation, in the finding of uh, the documentation that can help us, uh, putting all together the literature, which you can have access to since colonial days, especially the laws that have disempowered our communities in their land ownership. So that, Atama, is a very great deal because it's really about loss and land. Land will only be by the power because they have a document and we don't have it. We are disinformed, misinformed even as a population. So thank you to this global platform that uh, it sometimes even takes an outside view to take a re-reading, re-reviewing, unlearning of already entrenched knowledges and doctrines that have made us uh, accept right. so many, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. so many um, land, uh, so many knowledge, so much information uh, that mm -hmm. lends no question at all. Right. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Samira. Um, let's ask our uh, other speaker, Khalid. Yes, uh, this is a, a good question of how to, you know, people could pressure uh, the, uh, you know, politicians and Democratic Party particularly. But I think that uh, <clears throat> I come from a, a different school in terms of uh, pressuring uh, these, uh, you know, capitalist uh, parties. The United States is led by two capitalist parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, and they both represent pretty much the the same interest of the same class with a very minor differently. That's why you don't see real changes in terms of U.S. policies. And uh, because 
uh, the U.S. interest comes first. We know that all the wars that were waged against our people and the people of the world was always uh, unanimously. Uh, you know, they vote against war sometime unanimously, not even one or two, maybe Congress uh, people will oppose war. But the only time that they start having differences is when the people of the world resist and they start losing war, whether in Vietnam, whether in Iraq and Afghanistan, they reach to a point where they pull their troops and they start, uh, you know, blaming each other who, who started the war and who voted for the war and who didn't vote for the war. But eventually, when people achieve victories uh, mm. uh, in our, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the South uh, globe, in, in the countries and the people who are targeted by these imperialist uh, forces. Often people, uh, you know, they forget that the people of the Philippines never went and occupied Madrid and Washington mm. and Pekin. And, you know, they didn't go and occupy Japan. These imperialist forces came to the Philippines and they mm. plundered the resources of the Philippines and they waged war against the people of the Philippines. Uh, and not the other way around. So when there are, you know, issues or differences or conflict, you know, in the Philippines, you know, it is so easy mm -hmm. to blame the people of the Philippines that they are not getting their house in order. Right. The same right. thing goes by blaming Iraqis and Palestinians mm -hmm. for having differences or divisions. And this mm -hmm. is a colonialist discourse. The problem of our people, whether in the Philippines or whether is in Palestine or whether anywhere in the world, is right. this war machine mm -hmm. led by the United States uh, mm -hmm. and uh, these imperialist power. Mm -hmm. One final note, that mm -hmm. is, why did Israel support the apartheid regime of South Africa? Why mm -hmm. did they support the Contras of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Nicaragua? Why did they support mm -hmm. every brutal dictatorship regime mm -hmm. around the world and provide for them weapons and mm -hmm. political support and logistical right. support? Why do they do that? Why do they go outside of you know the land that they occupy okay. in Palestine and go and support uh, you know reactionary regimes in the in the in the area because they are one camp they belong to one camp and they def they defend their own interest so when someone asks me how do i pressure us uh, you know lawmakers i tell them to intensify uh, uh, you know the resistance in the united states to build the movement in the united states to support the black liberation movement and the indigenous people in the united states the haitian community the palestinian and arab and muslim community the filipino workers in the united states because these immigrants and refugees are natural allies to each other they are natural allies because they are subjugated to the same conditions and war, racism and uh, attacking our community under, you know, all kind of uh, laws uh, and racist uh, uh, laws and war against drugs and war against terror. We know that all of this is just a, the machine of the United States working inside the United States by oppressing the poor people of the United States and reflecting that outside the U.S. by waging these wars against our people. So the only uh, way I can see pressuring these Democratic Party, uh, you know, members is by intensifying our uh, organizing in the United States. Of course, there are voices in the Democratic Party that they are, uh, you know, they're uh, they, they, uh, pro uh, uh, movements and justice and peace. But how many are those? Those are very few, and uh, you know, wherever there is common denominators with them, we should uh, seek out to them and try to uh, build, uh, you know, uh, a movement in the U.S. Any victory in the United States is a victory in the for the Philippines and for Palestine. Thank you.
I think Cody, Cody can uh, share his answer while Atama is, I think, having technical problem. Cody and then Sahar. Yeah, thank you. I actually don't have much to add. I really would. I would very much echo um, Khaled's points on it's when it comes down to pressure, it really is, strength, is strengthening our movements, strengthening our movements capacity to wage campaigns and win victories, even if they're small, because then that builds up even more capacity um, to push for even more victories. Um, and I think one thing that's very um, crucial about those of us in the US who are trying to organize an anti-war movement around this is sort of goes back to what I said about really taking the leadership from, um, uh, from movements fighting for land and national self-determination around the world. Um, and really have that be at the forefront of our narrative here as we're organizing. Um, but yeah, I really do agree that, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, there are contradictions, yeah, within the ruling class parties here in the US. Um, there's a major, major um, sort of anti-Trump umbrella trying to be formed within the Democrat, not just the Democratic Party, but in aspects of the Republican Party as well. Um, and, you know, trying to push many, having many of many sectors of um, the neo of the neoliberal Democrats trying to push for their influence against the in the growing influence of Trump. And while I know any Democrat victory, uh, whether it's Biden or anyone else, um, won't fully push forward the move the um, the victory of the people. Um, there are always ways that we can take advantage of those conflicts within uh, the ruling system to point out uh, where the where it is the system itself the the actual system of imperialism that the two parties um, fight to be the main representative of um, that actually is at the the core of our um, problems and so that gives much more opportunity um, to strengthen our movement which in essence strengthens our demands thank you cody um sahar can we bring you in on this uh, question one Sure, thank you. Um, um, I'll, uh, I'll give a practical answer. Uh, so my organization, we do what we call advocacy. Um, there is opportunities here in the US really to influence decision making. I, I'm not uh, naive. I know that, you know, this is um, a very difficult when it comes to the Palestinian issue specifically. Um, it's very sensitive here in the US and it's very polarizing. Um, but I wanna give an example of what happened in Yemen, for example. There were really uh, congregated efforts, especially among you know, civil society organization, humanitarian organization, think tanks, um, trying to put pressure on the US to stop uh, arms sales to Saudi Arabia you know, arms that are being used to, to target Yemen and civilian um, infrastructure, hospitals, other. And, um, and uh, I would build on this experience because it proved to be successful. It proves that, you know, um, when there's a, a group of organizations all working towards the same objective, um, uh, impact can be really made. I mean, uh, Trump ended up, you know, uh, uh, ordering, uh, you know, like bypassing Congress and and still um, um, doing the the, the arm deal. But uh, um, but on the Palestinian issue, one thing I really would flag is that there is here a very, um, I think, rooted and organized and strong. Uh, uh, Israeli lobby that um, there are perceptions really that the interests of the US and Israel are interconnected. I haven't seen anywhere else where there is a sense that, you know, the interests of Israel are basically at the, the interests of the US. So on, on the Palestinian issue, I think there's a lot to be done 
by uh, mm -hmm. by uh, civil society groups, by Palestinians here than in the U.S. But again, we face many problems related to divisions among Palestinians. And what even complicates the situation is, you know, um, the the the. Uh, position, the stance of countries like Saudi Arabia, like UAE, like Bahrain. So um, more and more Palestinians are losing partners uh, that can be effective, I would say, on the on the U.S. scene. Um, I don't want to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. seem very mm -hmm. pessimistic, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, this is unfortunately the reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Sahar. Um, Let's move now to uh, question number two. Um, it is uh, for Samira, uh, Khalid, and Sahar. Uh, the question goes like this. Are there laws immediately addressing the needs of the internally displaced peoples? And how can we make the government mm. take action for the internally displaced people's safety and rights? For two minutes, um, I give it to Samira. Yeah, um, there's uh, none really. So uh, the call really is to uh, pass the internally displaced persons bill in the Philippines. Help us remind the United Nations, the U.S. government, which donated so much to the Marawi rehabilitation, uh, much to the Bangsamoro, to the ARMM, formerly Autonomous Region. We need pressure. We need like-minded activists to write our Congress in the U.S. and other governments like Malaysia, which donated to the Philippines, and to ask how much money are we putting to social services of internally displaced persons. And so uh, there's no related. Uh, <laughs> there's not even a peace law uh, that would, uh, anti-discrimination law that would protect the internally displaced persons who cannot avail of housing because they get discriminated because of their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, what about your views, uh, Khaled? Well, quickly, I will say that, you know, in, in Palestine, for example, when we talk about Gaza Strip, uh, the vast majority of people there are refugees. They are in Palestine, but they are also refugees in their uh, uh, own country. The same thing goes uh, on uh, 250,000 Palestinian internal displaced uh, persons inside or the you know inside israel and for the past 72 years uh, uh palestinian refugees cannot go back to their homes sometime uh palestinian refugees live 10 minutes away from their original villages and towns and they still cannot even go uh, to see these towns and the, their villages and their towns. And so that's why for almost 18 months uh, on a weekly basis, Palestinians in Gaza were launching, uh, you know, the right to, to the march for right of return and break the siege. And every uh, Friday, there will be massive popular demonstrations under the slogans of uh, return, because that's the issue of Palestinian uh mm -hmm. refugees is the right to return not just you know uh, political cultural and economic rights in which palestinians are being deprived mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. uh right to uh, to begin with mm -hmm. uh sahar what do you think um yeah unfortunately uh, the majority of uh, displaced people around the world so i think i mean i hope my numbers are correct but if my memory is correct, out of the 70 million, uh, 40 million are internally displaced people. And um, yeah, as the, the Samira and Khalid mentioned, you know, there's no law. So for refugees, you have the Geneva Convention, you have the protocol, but there's no real like any um, convention or agreement or, or a treaty that's been signed to address the, the issues mm -hmm. of IDPs specifically. And this pause, a lot of challenges. Um, I think one of the challenge is um, um, because IDPs are, you know, displaced in their own countries. Usually, there's a sense that um, leverage are less, or you know, it's the the the, the same government mm -hmm. that needs to deal with their situation. Uh, mm -hmm. But but. Um, more and more we're seeing the gap addressed. So there has been recently some real efforts to 
bring in the discussion on IDPs, on the need to protect their right, on the need to have a kind of a convention for IDPs. And, mm -hmm. and in discussions uh, right now, we see that the issue of IDPs is mm -hmm. um, present like uh, very mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Um, just to add uh, a point of uh, discussion here when we're talking about the IDPs, uh, um, I, I live in Sabah, uh, Malaysia, and uh, over the past uh, 30 years, um, because of the situation in southern Philippines, a lot of Filipinos have sought uh, refuge here. But the uh, Mahathir Muhammad regime and the AMNO uh, regime during that time um, created a, a project uh, to use um, these uh, this displaced people um, in the democracy, in the democracy um, here in the Sabah. And the population uh, increased and the voices of indigenous peoples were marginalized. But today, um, the federal government um, uh, had crashed because the prime minister, oldest prime minister in the world, he resigned and the federal government uh, crashed. And there is a new government now, and this new government is looking for ways to tackle the situation of uh, the refugees and the migrants without proper documentation. And there is this thing in the Malaysian immigration law called the IMM 13. So this new government wants to attempt to provide IMM 13 documentation uh, for the migrant Filipinos and refugees so that they could be identified by their country of origin. Um, now let's move on to uh, the third question. Um, and this question is for uh, Samira. And please, uh, other friends, if you want to also uh, say something about this. Samira, are you confident that through the institutional changes in the Bangsa Moro region, such as shifting to a regional parliamentary system, will these measures induce better governance. Samira. Yes, Katama, it will be very slow. Uh, terima kasih to Malaysia and all uh, the, who has helped us get, get through these agreements uh, of decades, but it will be slow in being damaged from centuries of military warfare. So we really need the outside help. Atama, you've had in Malaysia a scholarship uh, boom, uh, an approach by which you actually let the professionals uh, really like uh, be, you know, uh, be given education subsidy. Right now, the Mindanao State University might be that closest form of subsidy, but uh, engineering technology, social studies, not many of them are the political elites that can really generate good governance models. We don't have that pressure from elites that have that kind of... Uh, uh, transformative, uh, how do you call, even push pressure uh, that can really mm. penetrate in national, international uh, influence. So we really need mm. that, mo how do you call, middle class, political elites, uh, mm. the help of even the international with solidarity groups that can mm. remind that, uh, you know, questioning these policies of landlessness, mm. uh, doctrines that have been with us for centuries. Uh, really need that kind of intellectual intelligentsia and the, mm -hmm. at the same time mass pressure uh, and then mass support, of course. So that really also requires as well international solidarity. Mm -hmm. And uh, Samira, talking about international solidarity, um, there, is a, uh, there is a mechanism within ASEAN uh, that links uh, Brunei, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia and Philippines, <laughs> which is called the Bimpiaga. Um, and we hope that... Um, uh, the government, the autonomous government in Mindanao, um, see this as a as as equally an opportunity, such how Malaysia sees this as an opportunity to further uh, enhance uh, cultural solidarity uh, in education, tourism, and, and all these and all these things. Bimpiaga is something uh, worth worthy uh, to, to, to give a, a deeper look in how we can forge um, at an international level some, some points of um, 
partnership and support. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we have a saying in our uh, indigenous uh, language in Sabah, uh, in the Bahasa, uh, it, it says, Masa Chamburu kepada kita. It means time is very, very jealous of us. You've been uh, joining us, our webinar today, and um, we've come to the end of our uh, program. Um, on behalf of the organizers, I want to thank all of you for watching, especially for our speakers. Thank you so much for your uh, inputs, your presentations, and as well uh, for our organizers. Thank you very much. Terima kasih banyak banyak. And uh, what do we do next? Um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, all of us to join um, these activities. They are the Palestinians hashtag action for return on September 18th to the 26th. I repeat, Palest Palestines hashtag action for return which take place on the 18th to the 26th of September. Um, it is a Palestinian return and refugee rights um, confronting normalization towards uh, liberation. And meanwhile, the whole month of September, ladies and gentlemen, is the Global Solidarity Month for the Philippines by the International League of People Struggle Asia Pacific. We want to also invite all of you to keep a watch out for further and more activities from ILPS Commission 10. Uh, you've been with me, um, and uh, I'm your host, Atama Kajama, uh, from Sabah, Malaysia. Uh, greetings of solidarity, and thank you for joining us in RISE, Return, Resist, a webinar about the Palestinian and Moro struggle for land, territory, and self-determination against imperialist and fascist attacks. It's brought to you by ILPS Commission 10 with the help of IPM SDL, Sami Duon, Suara Bangsa Moro, Sandugo, Resist US led war movement, Refugees International, Liang Network, Kawig, Akobakit, and the Philippines Palestine Friendship, uh, Friendship Association. Broadcasting to you live on Facebook page of ILPS Commission 10, IPM SDL, and Sandugo. Do continue the international solidarity. Let us not forget to tweet these um, code words or hashtags. Rise, return, resist. Action for return. Free Palestine. Balik Marawi. I've been your host. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you again on our next webinar. Till then, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Long live international solidarity. Thank you.